I've heard that the glacier Solhammer Jokull has been retreating a lot in recent years due to global warming and I'm really excited to go and see for myself. I've been bringing school groups here for over 20 years and I can't believe how much it's changed. The last time I was here, just uh, two or three years ago, this lagoon just wasn't anything like this. It's quite extraordinary now, this huge body of water and there are icebergs floating in it. It's quite incredible how much has changed in that time. It's not really possible to see any of the features of glacial erosion here, uh, the corries and the U-shaped valleys and so on, because of course the ice is still blocking the way. We can't see it, the ice is covering it. What we can see here though are features of glacial deposition. And I'm sitting on a small example of a moranic feature. This is a small lateral moraine that would have been formed by the glacier and the glacier occupied the area that's now got this lagoon in it, this lake in it. And it would have left behind on the edge of the glacier this pile of debris. And you can see by looking closely at this that it's a real mixture of particle sizes and shapes and angularities. This quite large chunk here has got a, got a very angular face to it. There are lots of smaller particles and there's sand amongst it as well. It's very, very poorly sorted. And that is uh, exactly what we'd expect this material, this moranic material that we call till, uh, exactly what we'd expect it to look like. It's been carried by the conveyor belt of the glacier and it's simply been dumped. There's been no sorting taking place whatsoever. And around me uh, are various other examples of, of moraines of one sort and another. It's a kind of uh, rather shambolic, chaotic sort of landscape uh, that's formed by, by glacial deposition. Ah, now look at this piece of rock. This is really interesting. You see these, these cracks here running through this rock. Uh, this is very good evidence of a process of frost shattering or what's called freeze thaw. And that's a process of weathering that is really, really important in this environment. And uh, a lot of the rocks around here have got these telltale cracks within them. And what happens is that the water, liquid water, will seep its way into the rock, into these cracks, and it will then freeze maybe at night or, or maybe as the season progresses. And the, the ice will, will expand and it will enlarge the cracks. And over a long period of time, and and a great deal of repeated cycles, uh, what will happen is that the cracks get bigger and bigger and bigger until eventually, and look, if I just push that up, you can see it just beginning to, to break away, and, and I feel that if I was to pull it enough, it would in fact completely come away, uh, and that's what happens uh, naturally. So, so I'm going to leave it like it is. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to let nature take its course. I'm now several kilometres away from the glacial snout. You can see it over my shoulder. And I'm standing in an area that we call the outwash plain. And this whole area has been deposited by meltwater streams that have come out from the ice and taken with it a lot of the material we saw back there. And it's just dumped it in a huge, great apron of material. And it's quite different. I, I, I've picked up a, a sample here to show you. And this, uh, this is what I've got around me here. This is uh, very different, really, from the till. This is the till and the moranic stuff that we saw earlier. Uh, which, if you remember, is very angular and it's very varied in its size. Uh, whereas you can see here, the outwash material is, is much more similar, it's much better sorted. And that's basically the effect of water. When water carries material, it sorts it out and it separates out the big stuff from the little stuff. It's still pretty, uh, pretty angular because it hasn't travelled very far yet, so the processes of erosion haven't really chipped away and, and taken off the sharp edges. But this material covers a, covers a huge area all around me as far as the eye can see really and going way out into the sea as well, this vast flat plain of the, the outwash plain as they call it here. I'm now about 100 metres or so behind the snout of the glacier and all around me is a sound of dripping. If you listen very carefully you can hear that. 
and, and there's a river, there's actually a river flowing out from the glacier which is very bizarre. So this zone that I'm in here is called the ablation zone and this is a zone of melting um, and this is a zone where the ice is melting, where the sublimation is taking place, uh, where there is carving taking place as well, chunks of ice are breaking away from the glacier, dropping off into the lagoon in the front. Now if I were to go further back, further up into the mountains, then I would get into a different area altogether. It wouldn't be an area of melting, it would be an area that we call the accumulation zone. It's basically where there is snowfall, where there are maybe avalanches and that's adding to to the overall mass of the glacier and it's the balance between the two zones the accumulation zone at the top the ablation zone at the bottom it's that balance that determines whether the ice is moving forward or retreating I'm told that if you listen very carefully to the ice you can sometimes hear it creaking it's really hard to imagine when you're standing here that this giant glacier is actually on the move now there are two processes by which ice moves. One is called basal slip, and basal slip involves the movement of large bodies of ice on the, on the meltwater. The meltwater underneath the ice acts as a kind of lubricant and enables the block of ice to effectively slide its way or slip its way forward. The, the other process that goes on is something called internal deformation. An internal deformation is where the individual crystals, the individual grains of ice, they just gradually deform in a plastic-like way in response to, to the mass of the ice and to gravity. Now those two processes, they work together in moving ice crystals through the mass in rather a similar way to a conveyor belt in a supermarket. And if you think about the items that you put on a conveyor belt in a supermarket, and those items all move their way forward, yet the overall conveyor belt stays in the same place. And that is pretty much what happens with a glacier. To find out more about the glacier, I met up with Ragnar Thorson, a highly experienced guide who's taken groups onto the glacier for many years. I want to find out more about the impacts of global warming on the rate of retreat and the thinning of the ice. OK, so Ragnar, can you tell me about what's behind us here? Because this is really dramatic. What's going on here? Yeah, it is, Simon. This is, this is the first part of the glacier that's going to be, be melting. Right. And, and we can see very clear evidence of that here, here behind us. We see the dripping water and we see the water filled uh, in the ground uh, below us. It looks to me, looking at that, it looks really dangerous. It, it looks like that whole chunk of ice up yeah. there is teetering on the edge of dropping off. That's true. And this will, this will drop. And this will drop very soon, I think. Uh, you, you can have it as a rule of thumb with glaciers at sea level in, in the summertime that they melt close to 10 centimeters a day. So this part of the ice is going to melt at an exceptional rate over the summer. So let's, let's think then of the bigger picture. You've been a guide for 15 years. That's correct. Uh, bringing students and adults from all over the world to the, to the glacier yeah. here. How has it changed in that time? It's been a significant change, both on the ice and, uh, and the, the volume of people that visit, visit the glacier. So if we start with the ice, uh, the glacier is melting, like I mentioned earlier, and it is reseating. And the terrain is changing, it's exposing new ground. And it's very interesting to see, see the new ground being exposed. So this is very much an attraction for people to come and visit. Looking at this then, what is the evidence of global warming? We can see, uh, first and foremost, the lagoon. And of course, the, the, the ground that's being exposed uh, when the glacier recedes. And we can see as well, uh, big evidence of the thinning of the ice. So uh, the glacier is thinning and thinning each year, uh, getting lower and lower and changing the environment. You know, is this glacier going to be here in a hundred years time? It's most likely going to be here in any way or, or form. We're, we're probably going to have ice in this area, but if it's considered healthy ice or, or moving ice, that's unlikely that it's going to be a healthy glacier and a, and a moving outlet glacier. What about elsewhere in Iceland? Would, would, I, would I find similar changes elsewhere? Yeah, you can find these changes changes everywhere in Iceland and you can see glaciers are shrinking and even uh, some of them are disappearing, considered uh, dead ice and just hanging off a cliff, being still and not moving, just sitting there uh, to melt. And I can see that even in my short lifetime. Can I just ask you a question about the measurements that are taking place here? Because I understand that, uh, that school parties now um, from you know, Discover the World are part of a scientific monitoring 
process and, and, and are monitoring some of the changes taking place. Could you tell me a bit about what that involves? So there are all sorts of monitoring being, being done on this glacier and this glacier is definitely one of the most monitored glaciers in Iceland and probably one of the most monitored in the world as well. You know, the monitoring process can take many shapes and forms. Up high on the ice there are GPS equipment in, in small cases that, that measure the movement of the glacier and that's the technology, uh, more of a tacky way of, of measuring. And then again, there are more primitive ways of measuring the, the movement and the melting of the ice. And just pulling a, putting a stick in the ground, waiting a year, and then you can see what, how much ground has been exposed during that year. People who want to come and visit this glacier, they kind of need to, to get their skates on and come and see it while it's still here, basically. Definitely come here, learn about this and see what's happening in the area. This is, of course, a live laboratory for everyone to witness what's happening with uh, global warming, what's happening with glaciers overall, and it's, it should be a concern for all of us as humans. So, Raddy, what on earth is this? It looks like a giant jellyfish down here. Yeah, yeah so in front of us here we can see uh, evidence of the glacier melting so this is a chunk of ice floating in the water. So this is an example on a small scale of a process called carving isn't it? Yes indeed. Eventually this ice will melt so the surface the exposed ice is going to continue melting and eventually uh, this ice will flip over and wow. exposing the other two-thirds of the ice. Presumably this could happen in the big lagoon so yeah. there could be a situation where a, a really immense bit of ice just just breaks away and, and lands into that lagoon and that would create a really dangerous wave I guess. Yeah potentially uh, when you have a big block of ice falling in the water it could create a massive wave. And, and in front of you down here this ridge looks like a ridge of ice here is, is this solid? No this is not solid so so there are many hidden dangers around. So you can you can get your ice axe underneath that. Yes, you, you can. can. Goodness underneath. Me. So that really is quite dangerous. You wouldn't want to, You wouldn't walk on that. No, I'm not going to take you any further than this. Well, that's a relief. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Having investigated what was happening at the snout of the glacier, Ragnar wanted to show me some evidence of glacial processes. Raddy, can you tell me something about this amazing bit of rock here? Yeah, here we can see scratches in the stone and the orientation wow. of the movement of the glacier. Um, so we would call these scratches striations. Um, and what you're saying then is that the ice, although it's a long way back now, uh, would have been over here and would have, would have gone over this rock and would have created these amazing scratches. Yeah. It's quite amazing really that it can do that. So this is, this is the result of a process called abrasion, abrasion. isn't it? Um, and we can demonstrate that with this, this sharp bit of rock here. What happens is that these rocks are trapped underneath the ice and the weight, the sheer weight of the ice presses down and as the ice moves these rocks are just literally ground into, the, into these solid bits of rock underneath creating these scratches going down in this direction. And this gives us an idea, I guess, of the orientation of, of the ice that it would, have, it would have done this. It's quite hard to imagine really because the glacier is so far behind us but once upon a time it was here a second process of erosion involves what's called plucking. Uh, and plucking is where the meltwater under the ice basically freezes to loose fragments of rock. And then when the glacier moves forward, it drags or plucks away these loose fragments, rather like taking out a loose tooth. And it leaves behind a really kind of jagged, uh, angular sort of surface, quite different from this rather smooth surface that we've got in front of us, which shows that sand papering effect of, of abrasion. It was fascinating to spend time with Ragnar at Solhamajokl. I'm now off to visit Thorsten Thorstensen, a glaciologist at the Icelandic Met Office. I want to ask him about the impacts of climate change on Iceland's glaciers. Thorsten, can you tell me something about yourself and what you do? I'm a glaciologist at the Icelandic Met Office and we monitor uh, the mass balance of uh, some of the ice caps and glaciers in Iceland every year and we monitor glacier changes all over the country and we try to peek a little bit into, into the future and, and uh, estimate what is going to happen in the near future and even one, two centuries uh, ahead. So we've been visiting Solhamajokl Glacier. Um, can you tell me what's been happening with that? Yeah, Solhamajokl is a valley glacier that flows to the south from the Middarsjökull ice cap here and it's very close to the main road so it's quite easy to, to visit. And uh, actually the front variations of this ice uh, this glacier have been monitored since 1930, every year. 
and uh, you can see here a picture taken in 1997 from a certain vantage point and another picture taken 10 years later and you can see that uh, the glacier has thinned and almost vanished from view at this particular site and there is data going back to 1930 like i said that indicates that uh, until 1970 the front retreated by a kilometer a thousand meters then it advanced by 400 meters uh, into uh, up to 1995 but since 1995 it has been retreating very rapidly every year by 50 meters a year or, or something like that so will it one day disappear completely in this current climate and in the projected climate the glaciers and ice caps in, Ice in, in Iceland are uh, projected to disappear within the next 200 years 150 to 200 years we will only have glacier caps on the highest mountains mm -hmm. if these projections that we have now uh, come true so do you do you think it's indisputable that there is a link between the melting of the ice and global warming it seems absolutely uh, indisputable yes we, we can see this everybody can see it with their own eyes that the glaciers are retreating and uh, losing volume uh, almost every year and uh, it is the atmospheric temperature that is the defining factor there and this temperature increase has also been measured of course in many weather stations here so we cannot sensibly relate this to anything else but global warming mm -hmm. and uh, we w the evidence that uh, the uh, part that humans are playing in that warming is, is very strong as well so my final question to you really is, is asking you to tell me who you think the winners and the losers are in the future with the changes that are likely to take place. Well, for a country like Iceland, uh, that, uh, it has often been stated that Iceland is at the limits of the habitable world, you know. So with milder temperature, Iceland moves maybe a little bit closer to the habitat into or more into the habitable world. Milder temperatures mean that you can do more agriculture and uh, fisheries uh, conditions for fisheries in the ocean improve tourists come to witness the glacier changes for example that are so visible in a place like Iceland but then uh, I think we also have to view this in the global context you know that, that there are very many negative and in some cases even catastrophic effects of, of uh, global warming. Talking to an expert in the field is quite a reality check there seems to be no doubt that the retreat and thinning of the country's glaciers are linked to climatic change. It's really important that people visit Iceland to see for themselves what's happening and with a bit of luck they'll be able to make a difference so that Iceland's glaciers do not one day disappear. I've had an amazing day here today and it's been incredible to see the changes that have taken place since I was last here and it just makes me wonder what it's going to be like next time.